I think we're going. Okay, so hi, Tony. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here, though. So I know. I'm excited. I feel like this is a, a long time coming. Um, so yeah, just going to speak to you a bit about your journey in RPA. What sort of market trends you think may happen in 2021, um, and we'll we'll go from there if that sounds good. So really? That's perfect. Great. Let's go, let's go. So how how did you first get into RPA? Was it sort of straight after uni or what, what was your sort of progression to, to get to into robotics? So I think my journey actually started in 2015, um, towards the end of, uh, probably say it was the end of 15, but I'd gotten into a job um, in the UK um, and London. I think it's a, if I remember correctly, it's the FDM group, um, oh, it's yeah. solvency. Um, so I'd go in, in there to be um, sort of like a software developer um, trained in .NET. Well, prior to that, obviously, I had I had a computer science background. Yeah. So I think towards the end of 2015, there was actually a buzz around RPA. It was beginning to get steam at that point. And even though I'd done my research, it was all closed. Yeah, you pretty much couldn't go into Stack Overflow and look at, you know, what people are posting or something like that. Yeah. It was all commercial and it was closed. Then, um, to, I think 2016, early, I think earlier in 2016, mm -hmm. I did get an opportunity with um, true FDM because it's a con it's a consultancy, so they actually place um, graduates at, at that point. So, I was working um, with Aviva at that point. Oh, okay. True, um, true FDM. Mm -hmm. cool. And the four, I think I can remember the first time I did my interview and they said, you know, are you aware you know, what you're doing? You know, <laughs> I was like, no, I'm, I'm a .NET well, I know I'm going to be coding .NET and blah, blah, yeah. blah. And they laughed because <laughs> it's completely different from what, of course, what, yeah. what I will be doing then. So, um, but it was easy. Like they were looking for .NET developers to actually cross train um, with Blue Prism back then. So it was like... Yeah. Um, after the interview, obviously I did my research before the interview, but after the interview, I was really lucky to get through, like, um, and I actually started my training. So back then, I think in 2015, 2016, uh, Blue Prism was like out there. Yeah. More than the other part, more than UiPath or Automation Anywhere. So oh, then I did my training for about two weeks. Right. I, was, I wasn't proficient at this point. Yeah, so of course. You want to see your training is like... Um, you go on YouTube and you kind of do training for like two days and you feel like you're a master, but I wasn't actually. So I literally started like that and pretty much, you know, got from there to 2016. Then, you know, pretty much it's been almost, uh, I'll probably say almost, it's probably five years now, but yeah. I'm kind of going, you know, getting to the point of like, I won't call myself a master, but I feel very, very quite, knowledgeable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. And are you, can you see yourself having sort of the rest of your career, do you reckon, in the RPA automation space? I mean, it's really up and coming still at the minute. A lot of people don't really know it sort of, you know, as much as they know other sort of, like you said, software developer roles. But RPA, I feel like is one of those things that in the pandemic has really come through a lot because, you know, the amount of sort of NHS um, organisations that using sort of RPA to automate their, their back end processes in, you know, hospitals and things like that. Do you think it's really going to, you know, keep going, keep soaring? And do you think you want to be a part of that, do you think, for the rest of the, 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 your career? And I pretty much I would say um, this, this journey actually started from 2015 because that was literally the first time I did of, you know, RPA. Um, so and a lot of the adopt you probably call them the early adopters at that point where you know actually the banks and the financial services and yeah. um, you had the um, logards which are the healthcare and stuff like that and also the um, government organizations but they were actually very manual mm -hmm. and really did a lot of automation but the you know the banks were like oh geez we're getting on this um it's quick we can get you know we can start getting returns and yeah. i think Towards 2020, things kind of changed as well. Um, if you, um, I don't know if you follow like the Microsoft and a couple of um, all these guys like in tech, mm. I see they were they actually said, you know, what we were meant to achieve with digital transformation in two years, we got it in two months, you know, mm -hmm. because that kind of sped up the whole thing. Yeah. And RPA became like a driving force for a lot of um, 
no companies as well like yeah, those of companies, most of the companies i i know uh, in ireland i you know the kind of financial services at that point they were deploying more bots mm -hmm. to add, you know contain the old workforce and kind of yeah. workload as well and i think the nhs was a very good example as well they started having a lot of um processes coming in you know and they had a lot of funny enough they had a lot of partnership you know, not just with blue prism but with all the major vendors mm -hmm. and they were actually you know automating a couple of processes which was very um it was very interesting like to actually see that kind of shift in the market mm -hmm. and i think also what was very very popular during the pandemic would have been um the forgiveness loan in the us mm -hmm. so, was a lot of automation in terms of that area as well. So a lot of government, small, medium business were actually em embracing OPA. Mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. In terms of me, if I actually see myself, I literally say, you know, I spent five years already, you know. Yeah, so of course. Half a decade um, for something. <laughs> it's kind of half a decade for, for something you love. Otherwise, I would have kind of moved. But, you know, going on from there, I'm kind of looking at a different angle. I'm looking at with the old RPA space. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually changing uh, dramatically. It's been changing towards um, from 2017. There's been, um, you know, we're going from traditional RPA to something called, you know, intelligent or IP automation. Yeah. So it's just changed. Your dynamics have changed. So I, I believe I'm still going to be part of that um, kind of driving force into getting you know, into the old space of intelligence, mm -hmm. which obviously is still maturing. RPA yeah. Still. I would say off year two is still maturing in terms of um, probably not maturing in terms of, you know, the advanced um, countries like the UK, mm -hmm. you know, the US and some of other places as well. But in other areas, you know, they're not really as, you know, up to date as advanced. Yeah. Days, as advanced. So I think a lot of people would struggle to even get into the intelligent automation space, from, you know, in comparison mm -hmm. to even getting to RPA. So yeah, I, that's my thought on that. No, no, great. And Obviously, we we've spoken quite a few times now, sort of on LinkedIn, about you know your um, your work in the RPA space, and we're obviously both involved in the in the group, the future female leaders of RPA. And I mean, I was just wondering, in terms of the company you're at now, I personally see as a recruiter that a lot of the RPA developers, engineers, um, it is mainly uh, you know a male dominated industry. Is that sort of is that the same at your company? Does that sort of reflect that um, example? Would you say? I think uh, ACL as an example is probably too big of an example, right? Uh, because um, it's it's a multinational company as mm -hmm. well, and I work in ACL Technologies. There's still other parts of ACL which yeah, I don't really work or interact with as well. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the ACL Technologies, again, still different sections within the technology space. Yeah. And in RPA, I'm very opportune to actually work with females. But as you said, um, they outnumber the males outnumber the females as well. Yeah. And I think this it's this is sort so of uh, it's not really related to the company. Sometimes um, mm -hmm. it could just be you know most of the time when people go for interviews, most guys, even seventy percent of the guys would apply for roles even if they weren't qualified. Yeah. But no yeah. females want to be, you know, we want to be sure they want to, you know, cross all your teeth. Have teams. to be sure of ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. For applying for some, some of those roles, and even I've looked at the dynamics. It's not just, you know, ACL. ACL does have um, representation even of females at even at the senior level as well. But you know, it's just trying to even get females, you know, into STEM programs and kind of gain them into, you know, the old space of ocean. But you would find a lot of females going for roles like business analyst, um, yeah. but not necessarily, not a lot for developers. And I think it's just the confidence factor, maybe, you I know. You're so right, especially when you say, you know, we we do tend to sort of, you know, make sure we've checked off every single box before we've applied yeah. for something. We have to be 120 percent sure of ourselves before before we go. And I think that's definitely that's definitely something I've realised as well. Um, and obviously we've. We both have, we're quite involved on LinkedIn. Like I know you post a lot on LinkedIn. I'm starting to sort of post a bit more on LinkedIn as well in, in 2021. And do you think you having a LinkedIn presence, like do you speak to, do a lot of people come and ask you questions about sort of the RPA market you're working in? And I know you always, you you have your jargon buster um, information where you sort of like try and, you know, simplify per things for people to learn more about RPA. Do you think that's sort of, do people come to you often and ask you sort of questions about how you would do things or sort of your interpretation on, on certain things? Um, yeah. Um, and again, this is even outside LinkedIn. Um, yeah. 
because before just prior to LinkedIn, LinkedIn kind of kicked off for me um, in 2020. And that was right. something I started looking more into because of the pandemic, you know, yeah. I had something else to occupy me. And I was like, oh, I might start looking other forums as well but I'd been on LinkedIn for a couple of years but then I was focusing on a different um, platform which is mm-hmm. Quora so which was sort of like you know questions answers kind of forum as well so yeah. it would be a little bit different from let's say like sort of stack overflow and stuff like that but yeah again, of written text you know people asking you know about technical and non-technical details as well and that was something I started again in 2016 when I kind of really got into the old thing I started writing more um on Cora so I did get a lot of um you know I wouldn't say popularity back then but it was a lot a lot of people knew me from Cora because it was like you know Google would have in Google actually indexes those pages properly like more, yeah. more than even LinkedIn like and a lot of people have just you know happened to have saw my comment um and because those questions were like you know what is rpa you know <laughs> what can rpa do and stuff yeah. like that so a lot of people kind of you know looked up the comments they liked to the comment um kind of started following me on quora they went to my linkedin it was literally a dead end do you know i wasn't yeah i wasn't really doing the old linkedin stuff so it was like you got on there dead end um, yeah i got a lot of you know when i came back to linkedin i actually saw like 150 um, messages a lot of people asking me things like you know <laughs> do you want to collaborate on a couple of things and I was like actually I was like I'm so sorry I'm not this rude you know it's yeah. just I don't use this platform at all no, and pretty much and I think kind of that was actually the I would probably say that was the origin or probably the journey of the you know the op here Jagon Buster then yeah. I said I noted, you know people already ask me questions about OPA um Especially back then, I used to answer a lot of questions about, you know, Blue Prism. Then at some point, I started answering questions on UI part, then things in general about different mm. technology. And I said to myself, you know, I'm actually just, you know, give myself a new name. Um, yeah. I give myself a new name. And back then, because I, it was something I was always doing all, all the time, like talking about jargons, talking about simplification and stuff like that. Mm. And I said, I might as well just give myself a new name, um, the RPI Jagon Buster. And I, I can remember the first day I did it, when I changed my name, I kind of kept it as my, well, made your name. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people messaged me and they were like, oh, I really liked it. I really liked this name. Like, I was like, oh, really? I didn't know people would notice that I even changed the name. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? Yeah, so of course. It was like, I was like, okay, cool. Um, a lot of people are, you know, seem to notice this name because that's the first thing they see um, when they see the name. And they're always yeah. like, me what's up with the op here jagging so what you do with this and i literally said i'm looking at you know this it's i'm almost like curving a niche for myself so literally i was like okay maybe i need to start investing in this kind of brand you know, you know do more with it like yeah literally i was like i'm gonna do more polls every monday no one told me to do that but i decided i'm gonna do more polls every yeah. month i'm gonna confuse people and ask them you know what is this and see if people actually you know vote on and funny things that's been really doing very well yeah, they do, so do they polls, do you do videos and stuff like that. But all, all of them I just kind of geared to was education, which is mm-hmm. something I'm quite passionate about. Yeah. I'm really interested in trying to get more people into the space um, as the space is quite small. Yeah, in comparison definitely. to like, you know, the traditional software development and stuff like that. And and there's a lot, there's a lot I'm seeing with OPI and some benefits. Even employees or users can actually, you know, gain if they actually gain to the space. For sure, for sure. No, that's great. And I mean, I definitely know what you mean. It is a small, it is a small space compared to, you know, like you said, other sort of software and and like spaces like that. And it's interesting because I feel like the RPA community on LinkedIn, everyone sort of knows each other. You know, you get the same sort of people you speak to and it's nice, it's friendly, but you definitely do want to sort of bring it out for sure. I mean, and in terms of sort of RPA trends, I mean, I obviously looked at the Gartner report of the end of last year and, you know, hyper automation was something that sort of kept being, you know, put in like constantly. That's the sort of thing that happened in 2020. Do you think, can you sort of see any trends going to be taking off in 2021, do you think? Or do you think hyper automation will still be leading that? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, I think, um, what I don't like, I actually don't like the name hyper automation. No, you um, don't. I literally, I was using it for a while and um, I started seeing the light. I used right. that. I started seeing the light and I started calling it intelligent automation, mm-hmm. right? And this just go, go, goes back to what I was saying, like a lot of people confuse us with different names, yeah. but they actually mean the same thing, you know? So I look at it as intelligent automation, which is more simplified. Mm-hmm. I don't think hyper means going over and beyond, 
yeah. which in yeah. finance that's not that's not going to happen people going over and beyond automation you know mm-hmm. so it, you could probably sure. call it like intelligent automation i i not kind of look at intelligent automation in different kind of light that other people might look at it i look at it as a sort of amalgamation of a couple of technologies they love approaches as well and yeah. to kind of get you the end-to-end um automation and um you know, I'm glad you actually mentioned this because the um, thing I think intelligent automation became something started gaining a bit of steam in 2017, actually. Right. Um, but again, there were different names for the same thing, and each of those research firms, um, H- HFS, came up with their own name, integrated um, platform. I think they called it integrated process platform, something like the automation platform, something like that. Yeah. And you have different people calling it different names, but in general, it's still the same thing. And yeah. Um, I think 2019, um, Gartner actually actually, actually zoomed, in it, zoomed in on it mm-hmm. and, you know, you know, made a name and said, you know, we're going to do whatever they do. Like, it's going to be IP automation. Yeah. And that came up as part of the trends for 2020 and also mm-hmm. came up as part of the trends for 2021. Mm-hmm. But I think it's it's what all companies should be gearing towards. Like, um, if we're actually if we're actually there, that's a question, which I believe we aren't. Yeah. Because um, from my experience, I've worked with a couple of companies as well in the financial services, which they are more termed as, you know, more developed in the space. Mm-hmm. And they haven't ready, you yeah. know, intelligent automation because that's like, you know, you need to get all your ha- your hours together. You need to, you know, do all your housekeeping before you start thinking about intelligent automation. Yeah. And a lot of people, like, I've worked with my joint clients that have between, you know, 100 to 300 bots in production. And I've also worked with clients that have zero Mm-hmm. Production and both of them are still the same trend. They are re- potentially ready yeah. for industrial automation. Um, they could potentially use some of the, you know, some elements here and there. You have the likes of, uh, you know, Google Vision, all these kind of things. You know, a bit of low code, not code, but you know, it's yeah. very hard to actually say, you know, we are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it would be a trend for the next um, three, four years. If you ask me, it's going to be a trend because we're going to be maturing. A couple mm-hmm. of years, but they are some. If you actually ask me, I know I'm expanding a lot, but um, the two areas I kind of look at as leading the force in terms of intelligent automation. You're probably looking at um, the some. You're looking at intelligent virtual assistant, mm-hmm. which obviously has been another part um, of automation that's been maturing separately. But yeah. you know, coupled with RPA, that could be something bigger. You know, mm-hmm. and sure. you look at the um, intelligent document processing. Again, that's part of intelligent automation as well and that seems to be maturing then the other areas that would mature in the next few years uh the likes of process mining a lot of people would have more adoption there'd be more adoption for process mining or different technologies but again it would potentially i would say you can ask me this question in five years i feel yeah, we'll do this again on this day on the 27th of 20, 2026 we'll check in yeah, and just see how it's done yeah i will for sure no, that's great and i mean I get completely what you're saying as well. You know, a lot of times I find that companies I work with sort of start sort of running before they can walk. And then, you know, they use this, like you said, the words like hyper automation to get everything sort of started and going really quickly. But like you said, the housekeeping's not been done. So, it, it, you know, you have to sort of take simple steps. And I think that's sort of the, the main the main issue I find when I speak to people who have either sort of, you know, started creating bots and it's just sort of stopped because of x y and z you know the the planning that hasn't been there so i think that's definitely definitely a great point and my last question for you is what would you say to someone who wants to sort of get into rpa who so maybe let's just say they've just come out of doing a computer science degree they're not too sure they've heard of rpa would you say sort of start to research it look at videos on youtube like what, what would be your advice obviously someone who's been doing it now for like four or five years for some, you know, for you back in 2016 or 2015, what would you say? I think I think the advice would be in two folds. Um, there is the advice for someone that comes with a computer science degree, like myself. Um, you're already technical. Yeah. We just need you. We just need to tweak you a bit. We need to spice you a bit with a biz, bit of business logic, so you understand and get on your path. You know. Yeah. But, you're talking about I, that's one that's one fold then the other fold is someone that doesn't have any technical experience in terms of yeah. you know like computer science graduate you're not from a stem degree or something so that mm-hmm. it's a bit of a different advice for both of them so of if coming from a computer science degree uh, most likely i would always say um you know just for both of them like just start your journey like um a good example would be you know going to going to the ui part academy um it's one of the biggest to be honest with you um 
again, I'm not shading any of the vendors. Um, I do work with a lot of the vendors, so yeah. I'm not shading any of them, but it's actually, they have the biggest, you know, community, user community. Mm -hmm. So I literally say, you know, start with something like UI part and, you know, you know network with the community. Yeah. And get to learn. There's a lot of, to be honest with you, in comparison to the other vendors, there's a lot of UI part videos on YouTube. Right. There's a lot on, there's a lot of focus groups as well. There's a lot of WhatsApp groups, which I'm part of, um, that you can actually join and actually start learning as well. But again, there is that point of, you know, when you're self-learning, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. When you're working with a company as well. Yeah. So again, you're trying to get your technical, um, I would probably say brush up your technical aspects, brush it up, like, mm -hmm. you know, Excel, do all those kind of things um, before actually, again, and that could, could also, sort of help, like you do all those, your prep work, you know, do all the technical stuff before actually getting into a company. Most likely you could also get certification. Um, yeah. That could be handy, especially if you're new and you have no experience. So that could be very handy. And um, if, again, when you get to a company, you're probably going to be learning a lot of soft skills, not necessarily mm -hmm. hard skills, which yeah. is what we sell developers as well. It's not always about the ad skills, it's not about I can code. Yeah, we know you can code. <laughs> <laughs> so, RPA isn't really all about coding, you know. No, of course. 20% or probably less than 20% is about your code, but if it doesn't align with the vision of the company, you're wasting your time. Yeah. If you don't have a bigger picture, you're wasting your time. So literally for a technical person, brush up your technical skills. You know, you could learn .NET, you could learn, you know, just learn your Excel, your, you know, your Microsoft Office mm -hmm. kind of automation. Try and familiarize yourself with also the, you know, kind of the web, you know, web browsers and stuff like that and how yeah. to um, web, do web automation as well. But for someone from a non-technical background trying to get into RPI, I would also say try and brush up your Microsoft Office because 100%, not 100%, but 90% of what you'd be automating would have something to do with Excel. Right. So if you if you if you're still not familiar with Excel and you're not able to like I'm like literally you're not able to think around you know outside the box mm -hmm. and you know, automate something on Excel even if it's macros then you're in trouble. Right. Yeah. So um, kind of brush up your you know the Microsoft Office kind of mm -hmm. thing as well. Then try and get into an academy and you know network with a couple of people that are really in that space. Yeah. Try and learn the basics. To be honest with you, you can't really learn how even though i did my training for two weeks everyone thought everyone was expecting an expert you know yeah it was like an imposter like i just came in i didn't know what was going on and i literally like a few days ago i said to someone like you know my first two bots i created they never go into production i never got them into production yeah because um, i was all thinking about the technical aspect of things i didn't really understand what i needed to do and this is me in insurance i've never worked in insurance i've never won a policy i've never done anything you know yeah. You've been very technical and kind of going, I want the best solution. But at the end of the day, when I left, my friend um, Tom rewrote the old code, like 95% of the code. And Tom yeah. Tom wasn't wasn't a software engineer, right? Yeah. He, from, he had a very business. He had worked in the business. He was more like a citizen developer. But yeah. he wrote my old code, and that worked 100% compared to myself that I'm very technical. And that's how it works, like, oh, yeah. Like, necessarily about what you code but just understanding how to think logically how to understand your you know business you know the business yeah. domain and so it's literally i would advise people as well then kind of just keep on upskilling you know mm -hmm. get more certification even though certification is not everything but you know keep up working on yourself yeah, keep on, keep yeah. On keep yourself like yeah I think that's very advice. Well, that's perfect. Well, thank you so much, Lonnie, for taking the time to speak to me. And um, yeah, really excited to keep working with you in the future. Thank you so much. See you thank later. You. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye.